All right, Lamentations, chapter three. Um, this series is called Good Grief, so we know how to grieve in, in good ways and, and not bad ways. So here it is. If you've never read the book of Lamentations, here's what it is. It, it's five poems that are all collected together in one book that make up five chapters. Now, Lamentations is about grieving this sorrow because the nation of Israel has been destroyed and exiled by this Babylonian kingdom. Now, they, the surprise in the entire book is this, that God actually orchestrated the demise of Israel. You're like, well, I thought Israel was God's people. They are, but they didn't act like it. And for 23 years, they, they fashioned these little idols and worshiped them and disregarded who God was. God is deeply grieved over a people who claim to be God's people and yet act differently. So God's like, okay, so you want to do life without me? Let me show you what that's like. And the nation of Israel is destroyed. And Lamentations comes after this, and it's this expression of, of just deep grief and sorrow. But mixed in with that are tremendous words of hope. Here's why that matters. You carry grief. Maybe a little bit of grief. Maybe today you carry mounds of grief. But you also carry joy. If you're a follower of Christ, you have a joy within you. How do we carry both of those? So week one, here's what we, we talked about. We respond to grief with prayer. We cry out to God for God's help. Week two, we respond to grief with confession. See, sometimes the sorrow and the grief in our life is like, God's way of getting our attention to go, hey, there's something I want you to look at. And there, there's moments in our lives where we have to say, God, I'm so sorry. I apologize. I, I confess the thing I, I did wrong. So that brings us to week three. Week three is this. In this poem of Lamentations, chapter three, it's all about hope. The point of teaching a message like this and the point of you listening to this and, and understanding it, it has to move beyond just like, oh, I get it. I understand the message. Here's why we preach and teach. It's so that you will apply it to your life and your life will be different, okay? It, it doesn't matter if it gets into your head. It's actually got to get into your heart. So in order to do that today, we're going to do something a little bit different. Are you ready? Lamentations is five poems, right? So here's what we're doing today. This message has got to be sticky. I want it to land in your lap really well. So when you walk out of here, you're thinking about it all week. So here's what we're going to do. You ready? You, you are the poet today. All right? You're going to write a poem. I know some of you, some of you are like not excited and some of you are excited. See, there's some right brain people who are like creatives and like, oh, I get to write my creativity and put it on paper and you're pumped. And there's some left brain people in the room. You're not excited right now. You're analytical, you're logical, and uh, you're not excited because you don't know when you're going to get it right. You know what I'm saying? Like you need a metric that says, oh, you got an A, way to go. I don't care if you're right brain, left brain, listen, listen. Do this because this will make it sticky. So here's what you got to do. Grab your program, all right? You, when you came in, someone gave you a program, and there's probably a pen around you. You're sitting front row, reach back, grab a pen. They're in the chair backs in front of you. If there's no pens around you, look down your aisle. There's a woman. Find the one with the largest purse. There's 37 pens in there, all right? Ask her to share, and, and this is what you're going to do. You're going to construct your own poem today based off of Lamentations chapter three. It's gonna help this thing land and stick. So here's your poem. It comes in four parts. You ready? Part number one starts this way. My darkness is. Uh, Lamentations chapters one and two, it's all about this national sin and national grief. It, it uses words like we and us. But if you notice in Lamentations chapter three, it begins by Jeremiah's personal expression of grief. It uses the word I. Chapter three, verse one. I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of the Lord's wrath. He has driven me away and made me walk in darkness. Underline that word darkness. Rather than light. Indeed, he has turned his hand against me again and again all day long. All right. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to finish that, sent that sentence, my darkness is. And I want you to write 
whatever the thing is that you grieve right now. Or maybe it's a recent grieving. If it's, if it's right here and right now, fantastic. Uh, what's a recent dark moment? Something made you sad, sorrowful, a grief. Or maybe, let me just put it this way, um, something in your life didn't turn out how you had hoped. I just want you to write that down. I, I think I gave you like four or five lines there. Um, some of you, you can totally express that however you want. I mean, um, left brain people, if you just want to write like, this is what happened, it was bad. That's fine, all right? You just go. You, uh, you, you right brain people, I want you to feel free to be as creative as you want, and you can write in iambic pentameter if you'd like. I'm sure if I gave you more time, you would pen a sick rhyme, right? Are you staying with me? You okay? You're not writing, are you? All right, write, write something down. What's the thing that's been dark in your world? Because we're going to move on to the second part. And it starts with this, God, you are. Because that's the movement in the Lamentations chapter three. It shifts from, here's my darkness, to God, I'm gonna change my focus and take a look at who you are. Here's what's interesting about Hebrew poetry. In poetry, the crescendo, the climax of the poem is not at the end, it's right in the middle. That, that's where the answer lies. The answer is really hope. But I, I want you to make note of this, that for Jeremiah, Hope for Jeremiah was based on God's character. I'm going to say that again. That's really important. The only reason that, that Jeremiah has hope, he's not trying to just like will himself. Like, they're like, yeah, today was bad, and, or the last 23 years have been bad, but like, I'm just going to be more hopeful. That's just dumb. That's just trying to cheer yourself up, and you will get exhausted at that. It won't last. His hope rose because of God's character. Let me show this to you. Verse 21, yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. That's where we get that song, right? That old hymn, great is thy faithfulness. See, when we're in pain, when we're in pain, all of a sudden it gets into our heads and our, our minds just start swirling uncontrollably. Have you ever had that? When you're struggling, there's a conflict, there's something happening, and all of a sudden your mind is just whirling and you can't stop it. But Jeremiah says this, yet I call this to mind. He takes his thoughts captive. He's like, I know I'm thinking all these bad things. Stop it, and yet this I call to mind. He forces himself to consider this. Who is God? Now, this is very interesting because Jeremiah leans into the reputation of God from history. He can go back and he can look in, in the, the Old Testament scriptures and go, yeah, but who was God? Listen, he rescued a people from Egypt and made those people his own. God did that in history. And because of that, God was faithful. Now that we're at a new point in history and our people are captive again, we're gonna trust that God will do it again. His hope rose when he started defining God by his track record. Now, listen, Jeremiah refused to define God by his own, by this one moment of disappointment. This is really critical because it's really tempting when something goes wrong in our life that we're gonna define God's reputation by who God is by one moment in, in our time. Maybe it's by one year. Maybe it's by one decade, and you had a bad day, a bad year, a bad decade with God, and all of a sudden you're like, God is. What do you call someone who defines something by the very thing right in front of them? They're called short-sighted. Short-sighted means you can really only see what's right in front of you, and you don't look at the long game, where you look at who the history of God is. Now, you have all of the scriptures to open up and say, what is the reputation of God? People who experienced him and wrote down their stories? What is God's reputation? And Jeremiah declares, when I think back, God is loving and he's compassionate and God is, he's faithful. So I want you to do this. You write for a moment. How would you express God's character by leaning into two things? God's reputation from scripture or when he showed up in your past. 
Meaning this, you had a situation going on and you said, God, I need your help. God showed up and showed off in your life. He answered your prayer. And you can think back on that and just go, yeah, I believe God loved me, showed me love, showed me generosity. The other place to look is what about the scriptures? What's God's reputation? So God, you are what? And if you can't come up with a story or an illustration from scripture, uh, let me maybe highlight maybe the really well-known story about how our world was in darkness and God sent his one and only son, Jesus, into the world. And he's called the light of the world so that he could push back darkness. And he dies on the cross for the sins of the world and is resurrected to prove that he was more than just a, a man who had crazy claims. And God did all of that for us because he, he loves us. That's his character that was driving that. So here's what I want you to do. You already have your darkness written down. What would you write about who God is? About his character? What stands out to you based off of the history of the Bible or the history of your relationship with God? And at the very end of that, here's what I'd like you to write. Therefore, I have hope. Because that's what Jeremiah writes in verse 21. Yet this I call to mind, I'm going to remember, I'm going to write it down, I'm going to think about it, I'm not going to let my pain right in front of me be the only thing that defines who God is. And therefore, because of God's character, I have hope. All right, you with me? You got two things at this point, and we got two more pieces of this puzzle to put together. Uh, the first is, you've got your darkness, and then you've got the character of God. Part three is this, therefore, I will. This, this is about a call to action. This is about what you're gonna do. Despite the hurt, Jeremiah is saying, I'm gonna choose to focus on God's character and it's gonna drive me to act a certain way. Here's where it says this in verse 24. I say to myself, now as I read this, I want you to like try and underline all of the, the actions that he's, he's committing himself to. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. That means my inheritance. Uh, God reached my people years ago and I've inherited this relationship with God. Therefore, I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for man to bear the yoke while he is young. Let him sit alone in silence, for the Lord has laid it on him. How many actions did you get? There's the action of waiting for God, the action of seeking God, and then it re repeats it again, waiting quietly. And then you get this one, sitting alone in silence. I mean, that's not about like sitting alone and just like absorbing the pain or, 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 or pretending things don't hurt. Sitting alone in silence is about anticipating that it's not, that the pain's not gonna last forever, that the grief is gonna end because of this, because of God's character, he's gonna show up in your life and help you. It's about waiting for the darkness to get pushed back by the light. Some of you know this about me. Years ago, I worked with uh, students, and one of the fun things I got to do was take high school graduates on these graduation trips. And this was like my favorite time of the year, uh, because it wasn't like a, we were going to go visit colleges or like do a fun, entertaining trip. This was more of a um, survival trip. We took high schoolers uh, who have never been in the wilderness before and took them backpacking for seven days. Super fun. They knew nothing, right? So my very first uh, trip that we did, I didn't know very much, even though I'd grown up as a, a kid backpacking, but I didn't trust myself to keep 10 of them safe in the wilderness, right? So I hired these wilderness guides and all week long, they're teaching us amazing survival skills and um, we get to the last night and they say, hey, tonight's solo night. I was like, I don't know exactly what that is, but it sounds like I'm gonna be alone. They take all of us and they spread us out so you can't see anyone and this is what you get to do. Think about it. You're a high schooler who's never been in the wilderness before. Now you, you've been kind of sleeping with a group of people. Uh, no tents, just sleeping bag, right? And now they said, hey, by the way, now you're going to be alone. I was like, do we got to like go kill something and bring it back for dinner? Like, 
Nope, just be alone. And they said, by the way, if you want to make it a little bit tougher, a little bit deeper experience, you can leave your sleeping bag behind. Um, 9,000 feet elevation in June. We all have these uh, zero degree mummy bags at night. You know, if a bear comes and eats us, at least we're warm, right? I mean, a bear walks by, he's like, which burrito am I going to eat first? Um, so 9,000 feet in June is probably about 40 degrees at night. So what do I do? There's no way I'm letting a high schooler tough it out more than me, right? It's just, sorry, that's pride, ego, I know, don't care. So I leave my sleeping bag behind. But I empty my backpack of every piece of clothing I have. I, I go away and I have like mittens on and three other pairs of socks over my hands. I just have these knitted clubs at this point. Well, I find this huge rock and there's just kind of little divot next to it and a little bit under it. I clear out the brush. I stack up vegetation. I build my little fort so that no wind can come through there. And I go to sleep because the more you can sleep, just the faster this will be over. And it worked for a while. And I wake up in the middle of the night. I don't know when it was because we're not allowed to bring watches. And it is just, the sky is beautiful, but I can't feel my hands. And I've got my boots on, but I can't feel my feet. And I know what I have to do. I can't lay in here. I have to get up. And so I get up and I start doing push-ups and I start doing jumping jacks. Like you just gotta move, you gotta exercise and get warmed up without sweating because you start sweating and that's just a bad, you're gonna get chilled and it's gonna be even worse. That cycle of freezing and exercising and then trying to get back to sleep, that went through this rhythm of five or six times that night. And at one point, I'm just so exhausted, I just lay down and I fall asleep. I don't know if it's 10 minutes, or 30 minutes, but I wake up and I look to my right and there's a red glow in the horizon. That red glow meant the sun was coming up. That sun was coming up and the light was about to shine and push back my darkness. And I know I can picture this because I said it out loud to myself. I said, I made it. Because when the light starts to show up, you know you made it through the night. And I tell you that story because of this. You wrote down a darkness and you wrote down something that you believed about who God was. And now there's this action he expects you to take. What action can you take so that inside your heart, your hope stays warm? That you don't give up that you don't give up on God, that you don't give up on faith? What can you do to wait on God, to seek him, to keep your hope warm inside? Because here's what's so interesting about that analogy. It, it's great because when we know that the sun is gonna come up, it's like that daily rhythm, right? We know the sun's gonna come up, we just trust it. We've seen it for so many days and years of our life. Like it, it just happens. I mean, every 24 hours, like here comes the sun. But when you're in darkness and pain from whatever it is you wrote down, you don't know when the light of hope is gonna show up. And it's the timeline that's discouraging sometimes. You know what I'm talking about? Because if, if we knew when the pain would be over and the grieving would end, then we'd be like, okay, I can hang on till then. But the hard part is when you don't know how long it's gonna be. Notice this though. Your hope and your faith is actually based on the good times ahead rather than the goodness of God. Can you in the midst of your darkness say, this is what I believe about God and I'm gonna wait on him. These are the actions I'm gonna take. These, this is how I'm gonna seek him. This is how I'm gonna open his word. This is how I'm gonna share my struggles with other people and not isolate myself and be alone. So if you didn't write anything down under number three, do it now, what will you do? One of the greatest things that can happen when we're struggling is that we start growing and we start learning things. And I will tell you that sorrow will teach you much more than joy will. Listen to this poem. Uh, this poem is written by Robert Browning Hamilton and it reads this way. I walked a mile with pleasure. She chattered all the way, but left me none the wiser for all she had to say. 
I walked a mile with sorrow and never a word said she, but all oh, the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. Can I ask you a series of questions? What will you learn as you wait on God? Here's six questions. What can you learn about yourself? You might learn strengths. You might learn weaknesses. As you wait, what can you learn about God? You'll learn about him, particularly when you open God's word. As you wait, what stands out about God's character? As you wait, what priorities is God clarifying for you? Man, life is full of distractions, right? We get wrapped up in so many different things. And then we get into a bad situation and we're struggling. And then all of a sudden priorities become clear. These things don't matter, but these things do. Number five, as you wait, how can you seek God's face, not just his hand? This is such a good one. We want God's hand, right? Hey, God, would you do this for me? Give me this, show me this. Like, I'm asking for God's hand to do something in my life, right? But sometimes we just want his hand and we don't want his face. What is the face? It's when you're there with God, you're just appreciating his presence. I think sometimes we want God's blessings more than we want God. And sometimes our suffering clarifies that. To say, God, I, I really truly want you. The last question is this, how can you entrust the outcome to God? And that's about not just trusting that there's a good time ahead, but there's a good God with you right here and right now. All right, so here's the fourth thing. The fourth is this, and we'll wrap up. Hope is on the way. Let your, your final thing there that you're going to write, and I invite you to write right now, how is hope on the way? Jeremiah writes about it this way in verse 29. Let him bury his face in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let him offer his cheek to one who would strike him and let him be filled with disgrace. Okay, these are two really odd images. So track with me for just a moment. Face in the dust and then being willing to get struck on the cheek. What is this about? This is an illustration about the willingness to endure grief and hardship because we know it won't last forever. The darkness is now. But in the horizon is a red glow reminding you that the light is coming and hope is on the way. This is his very next words, verse 31. For no one is cast off by the Lord forever. Though he brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love, for he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to anyone. So here it is. Hope is on the way because God is compassionate. Hope's on the way because God's unfailing love. But then you get that last phrase, look at it. For he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to anyone. One commentator writes this, listen. Was it not God's will that his people were attacked and taken into exile? It's a rhetorical question. Yes, that was God's will. The term willingly, which in Hebrew contains the word heart, can be read as wholeheartedly. So he writes this, the affliction that God sends is not according to his heart. Punishing his people is not something God does wholeheartedly, but it is necessary. However, compassion is closer to his heart. Parents, you get this, right? Your kids do something unbelievably defiant. And you know for their good, you can't just go, that's okay. Because they will turn out to be an adult who does that same kind of thing and does that same thing to God. And when you punish, do you go, oh, got him? Of course not. It's not in your heart. You don't want to. But you begrudgingly do that for their good. And I think that's what Jeremiah is writing about here. So let me invite you to write this. Would you be willing to declare that you believe hope is on the way? And hope is on the way because of God's compassion and his unfailing love. I don't know what you're going to write. Try it though. Would you be willing to declare that you believe and trust God that he will meet you in the midst of your difficulty? And as you're writing that, let me just share a quick story with you. Um, many of you know this, that my wife, Kelly, um, her brother, Craig, died when she was a, a teenager. He was 19. Um, he was on a motorcycle 
got hit by a drunk driver. Let me be super clear about this. Uh, That was not God's punishment on their family. That was because of the result of living in a broken world where one person made some really bad choices and they decided to drink and drive. So in the midst of that, um, darkness hit their family. And can I be honest with you? There's still a darkness there because of it. They still grieve over that. There's still sorrow over that. But here's the truth. The sorrow they have today is small compared to the sorrow that they started with. See, because the day after that happens, you just grieve and you don't see hope. And those of you that experience an unexpected loss like this, you'll get this. That like, yeah, the sun came up that day, but we didn't even see it, didn't matter. Hope might've been there, but we didn't recognize it because it was so dark and so ugly and just so sorrowful. You've heard people say that grief happens in waves, like one minute you're fine and the next all of a sudden you're in tears and you're not sure why. It's because grief happens in waves. Get this. So does hope. You'll be sitting there one minute and you'll be sad and grieving, but somehow God will meet you in that. And in a wave of experience, God will help you, remind you who he is and that death never has the final word. And hope will rise in you. See, I love the sunrise. Okay, I'm a morning person. I get it. I love the sunrise because it's a reminder that God promises this, that our world was dark and Jesus entered into a dark world and he called himself, I am the light of the world. Because light is about hope and light pushes back our darkness. And the rhythm of the day and the sunrise reminds us that hope is on the way. And for my wife and her family, they've been, they had walked through that for decades now. And there's still a grief and a sorrow there. But hope is so much bigger than their grief and their sorrow. Um, the Apostle Paul, he writes this, and I, I will tell you why her family has hope. It's because they're anchored in, in the Christian faith. Because they all have a relationship with Jesus. And they're also anchored in the truth of God's word. Listen to this. Paul writes this to Christians who are struggling with people who've died. He writes in 1 Thessalonians, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who who sleep in death, okay? Those who've died. So that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. There are people who grieve without hope. That's not us. We grieve, but we grieve with hope. It goes on. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who've fallen asleep in him. Everyone grieves, Christians and non-Christians. But Christians, we grieve with hope because we believe that death doesn't have the final word. We believe that we'll see Craig again in heaven because he was a follower of Christ. We believe that God can meet us in this comfort. Man, Paul, the apostle Paul, he suffered unbelievably, maybe more than any other Christian And Paul talks about his hardships. I want you to listen to this in 2 Corinthians 4, 6. It says, for God said, let light shine out of darkness. That's why you're here. If you're a Christian, you live in a dark world, you know it. He's like, let your light shine in this dark world, bring hope to people. He made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. The only reason you know who God is is because Jesus came down. You look at Jesus' life about what he claimed about himself, that God so loved the world that he, he gave me, Jesus. He went and dies on a cross for our sins. We know the goodness of God. Now go be that goodness to other people. And the reason Paul writes that is this, because he suffered. Now I want you to hear his words because there's, there's, there's suffering and there's hope at the same time. Listen to this. We are hard pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. And so I'm gonna read this with some attitude because I think he wrote it with attitude. We're perplexed, but we're not in despair. We're persecuted, but we are not abandoned. We're struck down, but not destroyed. We are always carry around in our body the death of Jesus. What does that mean? 
That means Jesus suffered and died on a cross and he promised this to Christians. Like, listen, it's gonna be hard. You're gonna face difficulties too. You carry around. Paul literally had the markings of being whipped on his body. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. We can claim that God brings hope. But there's a world out there that's living in darkness. When God shows up in your dark moments with hope and the light comes in and pushes back the darkness, your story is gonna give somebody else in this world who's walking in darkness, it's gonna give them hope. But you gotta go live it out in front of them. You gotta go walk it out in front of them and you gotta share your story with them. Here's what Lamentations is in this theme of hope today. Hope is found in waiting silently and trusting the character of God to push back our darkness. Absorb that for just a moment. Hope is found in waiting silently and trusting the character of God to push back our darkness. Can I invite you that if you wrote down a poem or even a portion of a poem, that you would go share it with somebody today? Share it with your family members over lunch. It might help them and encourage them. And my prayer for you is this, is that hope would rise today. Hey, um, I'm going to end service a little differently. Uh, I'm going to invite us to pray. But if you know you need hope today, I'm going to ask you to do this. I'm not going to single you out. I'm not going like, to call you down here. We don't do that at this church. I just want you where you're sitting. I want you to stand. You don't have to tell anybody your story. We just want to pray for you. That if somewhere, it, you just know that, man, I'm just wrestling with something that is dark and I'm just struggling. I just got this grief and you want God's hope. You want his light to push back your darkness. I'm just gonna invite you to stand in just a moment as, as we pray. And I wanna pray for you. And there'll be people around you. They'll see that you stand. And then when we all close our eyes, they'll pray for you too. But I just wanna do that as it's for your sake, not for mine. So here we go. We're gonna go to prayer. Let's bow our heads. But if... Um, if you need to stand to say, I, I need hope today. Awesome. All right. I still see people popping up, so. All right, let's do this. If you see somebody standing near you, would you just do this? Um, just pray for them. Leave them alone. But would you just take your hand and like raise it towards them? And this, it's just, there's nothing mystical about this. It's just your symbol of just, God, I'm gonna pray for them right now. And so Lord, I pray for all those who are standing that they just need hope. Whatever it is their grief is, their sorrow is, the difficulty is that they're carrying, Lord, let them know that they're not alone. We all carry those things. Every single one of us carries something today. But I pray that God, that a, I pray that today that they would see the red glow of the horizon, knowing that you are coming and stepping into their world to bring them hope. And I pray, God, for everyone in the room who is not yet a Christian, that, God, our hope is in you, not in our strength and not in our ability to endure life when it's bad. So I pray that there'd be some people who today, they cross the line of faith and they say, Jesus, I need you. I believe that you came into this world, that you're God's son, you died on the cross for me, and I give you my pain, I give you my sin. In exchange, I want this brand new life in you. Lord, if, if someone needs to cross that line of faith, I pray they would do that and share it with me today. So Jesus, meet us in a real way. And we trust you because of your character, that you are loving and compassionate and that you are faithful. And everybody said, amen.